Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035 Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I'm the editor of this book. I am pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome Patty Wong, author of Chapter 8, The Library as Community Enthusiast, Champion, and Advocate. Patty Wong is City Librarian for Santa Clara City Library. She enjoys working in managing change, equity and diversity, youth development, collaborations between li public libraries and community agencies, and fundraising. She is also past president of ALA. As part-time faculty for San Jose State University School of Information, she teaches how to serve young people and write grants. Throughout Chapter 8, Patty Wong highlights how the Library of 2035 will not look the same nor serve the same community as they do today. She advocates that library workers at every level center their efforts and work on one thing, the patron, and to do so no matter their demographic profile. It's my great pleasure to welcome Patty Wong. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you, Sandy. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm really excited to talk to you today about your chapter, and let's get things started by, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what your vision is for the future of libraries in 2035. So the libraries of 2035 really need to focus on their entire community. It's no longer important just to have people coming in. Um, it's really to think about the library as that convener of, of conversation, um, as that engager of the community as whole to, to help build and sustain community. Um, the library of 2035 will be intensely focused and, and dedicated to the entire user experience, um, including digital and, and physical access. Um, libraries should offer services where every door is the right door, and they should engage all of their staff and all of the community as part of that process. I love that idea of every door is the right door. As you look into that future, what are you most concerned about? Part of the reason why I was so excited about writing um, this chapter with you is, is um, that libraries often rely on traditional or whatever they consider traditional methods of, of uh, garnering resources and, and, um, and working with community. And what we don't realize is when we actually have taglines that we meet community wherever they are, um, we really do mean that the, they're changing and their needs are changing all the time. We need to be rapidly um, thinking all the time strategically about how we can do a better job of, of creating access of uh, creating equity, of becoming a beacon, of um, making sense of the world that we live in because it's changing all the time. And if libraries become complacent and rely solely on um, individuals coming to us for service, uh, we're missing a great opportunity. And um, we won't. We will actually become irrelevant. And as, as so many. Um, prior predictions, you know, have really uh, in identified that libraries may become um, an older concept. We don't want to fall into that trap. So we need to be always um, communicating with our, with our community, uh, finding out what their needs are, adjusting our services to meet those needs. Um, and that's on a regular basis. And then building in processes, strategic plans, facilities, master plans, um, all kinds of mechanisms and inviting all of our community, our staff, our volunteers, um, our governing structures to follow suit and, and work alongside us to be as relevant as we can to the community. Uh, and what, what about the future excites you for libraries? One of the big opportunities we have is that uh, the community and our society continues to change. And so that makes the exciting part is being able to work alongside that change, uh, to measure how libraries fit. Um, but I think the, the biggest uh, opportunity that we have is really having that community conversation, making sense of the world, uh, bringing a different kind of look at the way we look at um, technology, 
at um, at uh, community engagement, at learning, and bringing all of those resources to bear um, as we continue to grow alongside with our community. That's actually the exciting uh, piece of uh, that change is actually not something to dread. It's something to plan for. Um, our um, libraries across the country are having incredible dialogues with their community um, in times when they are very troubled, um, when there's social unrest, um, to make sense of uh, the need for a stronger um, perspective on on equity, diversity, and inclusion as it pertains to everything that we touch. Um, there's also other opportunities, um, even challenges to to books and materials that we carry in our in our collections. The opportunity is is how we can convey messaging, how we can build community with community um, and 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 do what I think we've we've done every in every era that the library has been a part of um, is to continue to evolve uh, to meet that changing need within our community, to meet it head on, um, to not be neutral, to be able to discern um, with our community the different perspectives and and um, and to learn from all of that. So what do you think has had the biggest impact on libraries over the past decade? I think that um, what has been uh, both a challenge and an opportunity for us has been change. Um, the, the, we've seen more change in the past 25 years um, uh, that we could have anticipated, and, and that has happened so frequently. Um, uh, and, and then the change is actually collapsing, which, which, and, and by that I mean we've seen more change happen in the last five years than we have had in the past 25 years. Um, as a result of that, I think we're a little, as, uh, as organizations, a little fearful of what's to come. We haven't been always prepared. And so that um, instinct to sort of duck and cover is, is easy for us to, uh, uh, to actually play a part in the way we design our, our, um, our models of service. Um, but what's interesting is that the libraries even those with the le uh, with the least amount of resources that have been able to um, uh, participate in a more effective way um, have been the ones that have paid attention to their community, um, have met them where they were, and have designed services that actually meet those needs. And I'll give you some examples. Um, <clears throat> Some of the strongest libraries I know are actually in very rural areas where they don't have a whole lot of resources. But what they've done um, to meet the needs of their community a little bit better is assess what that community is going through in terms of um, uh, support that they need and then find partners um, to really meet those needs. So, for instance, telehealth. Um, is very big in um, in our communities, in, in the, especially in rural California, for instance, um, where so many people cannot actually make uh, a doctor's appointment because of transportation needs. And so the library actually sets aside a separate room. It's very confidential. And as long as they have good Wi-Fi, um, they're able to um, have the community come and take their, um, their appointment in the library. Um, that's something that 25 years ago we, we probably wouldn't have thought about. But right now, it's it's an easy thing for us to do. Um, <clears throat> and we meet the community's needs where they are. So many people have um, found, not found opportunities to talk about things that are important to them. And the library can often find um, a place um, and a neutral space um, and a facilitator sometimes within our own spaces, sometimes a partner that's come in to help us deal with these issues. When I was in Santa Monica, we had a huge riot in the community and it was race-based. We needed to um, bring together our community and so we held a number of community conversations to help the healing process begin and to have safe conversations. 
Those are great examples of the ways that libraries have changed and uh, can need to continue to change. Uh, what do you think will have the biggest impact on libraries in the next decade? As I've written, libraries need to feel comfortable with the change, um, to realize that we all can't do it alone, um, that the library is not an island, so we need to involve as many as possible, including partners, potential partners. Um, uh, our entire staff needs to be trained and to feel um, supported to meet the growing needs of our community. We need to actively listen to community, have regular conversations about what their needs happen to be. Um, and we need to be able to pilot and to test a few things. And if it works, that's wonderful. And if it doesn't work, then we try something else. But we need to keep moving. Um, we need to be agile and nimble and forward thinking. Um, we need to have that sense of appreciative inquiry where we continue to learn as an organization. We encourage our staff, our volunteers, our governing body to learn with us, to bring um, ideas together and holistically uh, to approach the changing needs of our community um, with a smile and a commitment to uh, growing the body of uh, and the universe of information um, and to not be fearful of any of that. It's, it's a... You know, who knew that um, many of us were going to carry Narcan in our, um, you know, behind our desks or, you know, even at our Santa Clara University, they actually have a, a little red box full of uh, Narcan so that um, community can help each other. Um, those that's what I believe the next, you know, the next 10 years will bring challenges and opportunities. We need to recognize them for what that is. Um, and and. Yes, I think we need to be discerning about how we expend our resources, um, but know that there is no wrong door when it comes to community coming uh, either into the library or being associated with us. And we need to meet those needs um, uh, with commitment, with, with dedication, with advocacy, um, and to make some good choices and good decisions on how we spend our time and our resources. Thank you, Patty. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, it's been a few months since you've written the book chapter that's going to be published. I wonder if any of your thinking has changed um, since you've written that chapter. I think, Sandy, that's a great question. If anything, um, I think one of the things that I, I wish I had had a little bit more room in the chapter to expand upon the fact that um, community recognizes that the library is a resource for them, but they're not sure exactly sometimes how to best use that resource. We need to kind of dispel um, the notion that everyone needs to know and understand what a library does. We actually fill a lot of gaps um, all the time. And uh, some of that all has to do with uh, learning and education and vetting information. Um, and, and being that sounding board for a community to make some good decisions about the, their success in their lives. Um, that has always been a part of our, of our role. And <clears throat> so to really embellish on that and, and, and to, to own that, um, we need to be prepared for what comes and to be active listeners and, and be able to, to tune into that. But I think one of the things that I wish I had emphasized a little bit more was the need for diversified finances to support the library's ongoing mission and evolving mission. Um, you know, what we know to be true is that, uh, uh, we have, we are fortunate that so many libraries across the country are, um, are well-funded, but there are certainly libraries across the country that are not. And um, with the wave of, and the impact of COVID and our sensitivity to economics, um, libraries really need to fortify the diversity of funding um, in, in the future. And we need to ensure that everyone is aware of the value of libraries. And that happens at the front line and it also happens um, you know, at the national um, consortial level. I do think that uh, the changing nature of our relationships with other libraries, um, with with communities as a whole, 
will mean different kinds of partnerships that rely on like-minded um, work that we need to accomplish together. Uh, one of the things that we're, and, and to give you an example of that, um, one of the things that uh, was put in my mind from staff, but also community users, is the fact that um, we all have wonderful collections. We spend a lot of time there. Um, wouldn't it be great if we actually could share collections, which we do within our library loan, the link plus, there's a number of ways we do that. But we also spend a lot of money um, on the same kinds of resources over and over and over again. Wouldn't it be better if we actually could invest in ways where everyone could receive the same kind of information um, uh, using AI, using all kinds of other technology and invest in the technology um, and the resources become a little bit more plentiful and accessible to as many people as possible. So a lot of folks are working on different kinds of notions of making um, that collaborative work uh, become part of our uh, our framework, our, our modeling, our, our development of service. And I think we too need to be on board to be at the forefront of that. Um, <clears throat> if it's not exchange of service and, and partnership development, it could even be retention of the collection. Um, so many universities that I know of, including Santa Clara, uh, not that far from me, have talked about the fact that they actually have a little bit of extra room in um and wouldn't mind actually taking on different parts of our collection if we had a need for that to happen so that everyone could benefit from the access. Um, <clears throat> that isn't just a, a small idea that um, that just percolates. We actually need to explore that um, and think about ways in which we can really share resources and access to resources, um, perhaps regardless of um, the types of funding that we currently receive. There's lots of things that we can do as libraries together uh, to make things work more holistically for our end user, the customer, which is actually all people. That's great, Patty. And I'm really glad that you had this, we had this opportunity to hear more of your thoughts to build on the content that's in the chapter. We were constrained and these are such important additional uh, 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 context and um, information to think about as libraries move into the future. So thinking about that, I was wondering if you have any advice for information professionals as they look to the future over the next 10 years. So I did use a um, a phrase that I, I like um, to to use both um, with students and, and and I'm grateful to be able to teach at San Jose State University um, as well as uh, my own staff. And that is the idea of appreciative inquiry. Um, uh, and I, <clears throat> a good friend of mine actually was looking for some um, things to coach about in terms of um, executive leadership and um he asked about that phrase because he wasn't familiar with it. And I, um, I was very happy to explain to him that in, in, um, in my career, um, one of the best things that I w ever came upon was that concept of appreciative inquiry, where everything that we touch, everything that we read, everything that we um, absorb in terms of information is based on the intellectual curiosity we have as human beings to learn more, um, to think about how to make the world a better place. And I've been able to trigger that into a lot of the work that I, I do um, on a day-to-day -day basis as well as in the future. So if anything, I would share with information professionals, not only in the next 10 years, but holistically, I hope throughout your entire career, that you think about the work that we do as based upon how to make the world a better place. And through that concept of continual learning. It's not just um, lifelong learning. It's actually how we learn and foster new ideas and build upon progressively those ideas um, and, and implement them in, in a daily and um, wide basis uh, to improve our circumstances, to improve the circumstances of others. Um, that's what I would share is I, I would hope that they would invest in themselves as as individuals to bring and to be 
on some levels fearless about bringing those new ideas to bear. Um, uh, the, they all bear a kernel of worthiness in terms of, of, of the work that we need to do. It may not be the best time to make those, some of those things happen, but definitely um, there's things that I've thought of years and years ago that, um, you know, and you take notes and you, and you, you keep them, um, keeping a journal of all of those great ideas and they will come and surface again, uh, to, to really, um, there'll be at a time and a place when all of those things will come, uh, to bear, but, um, appreciative inquiry is something I would, I would share with everyone. Um, and, and to foster that commitment to community. And is there anything that information professionals can do to better prepare for this, for their desired future? Well, I think we need to be, um, first of all, engaged in, in all of our community wants and needs and desires. Um, the other thing I believe uh, that would benefit us is to also be very cognizant of the development and the trends that impact the world as we see it now. Our community is impacted, um, you know, 365 days a week um, in in an arena that sometimes we're a little oblivious about. We need to be as cognizant of all of the impacts that impact our community um, so that we can be prepared and so that we know um, that some of these strains and tensions um, and needs for knowledge on our community, we can meet them right away, even in anticipation of, of, of some of those needs. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is a household name now. Everybody's talking about it. There's also a lot of fear and trepidation. And because people are not, they're, they're afraid of what might happen as opposed to what will happen. So one of the things our staff did right away is actually held, um, forums on the different aspects of AI. What is do, What do we mean by artificial intelligence? How is it already part of our world? And how can we use it um, for things that are very healthy and beneficial to us? And to be watchful about the things that are, um, that might be uh, not so um, beneficial to us. Um, I will say we started with our senior center because actually that's where most of the communication was happening. Um, and to, you know, we had hundreds of people sign up for those webinars. Why was it important? It was important because it met the community exactly where they were in the time that they needed it. We had so many people come and say, you know, it just made me want to learn more. And now I'm not so afraid of what it means. And I can talk a little more intelligently about it. And I, and I have an idea about, um, how valuable it is for me to still stay learning. That was, that was the best message I could have received from our seniors. Um, <clears throat> know that, you know, we, we need as library professionals and as information professionals to really meet our community at least halfway, if not further. Um, and to know that, uh, to not be afraid to drop something that we we might have been working on, and to uh, you know go in this different direction because it's a buzz with with our with our community. We want to be relevant to what their needs are, and if we wait too long until we get super proficient at one thing, um, we've almost missed that opportunity to be able to to share with our community um, that you know we don't have to be super. Um, uh, professionals at everything piece of information we touch, but we need to be right there for our community to be able to n navigate what it looks like um, in this very complex world and to make good decisions about their lives. So I think that's a great segue into my next question. Um, so what are those key competencies that you think librarians need to thrive in the year 2035? Uh <clears throat> Well, that sense of appreciative inquiry would be at, at the top, but I also think um, they need to be advocates. Uh, uh, they need to be um, curious about the world that we live in. They need to always be reading um, and, and learning and um, 
attending conference and and being aware of the professional benefits of of development um they need to bring somebody along with them uh if if there isn't enough support for that to happen um they need to coach and coach other people and they need to pay it forward <clears throat> so many times we um we learn of a new idea and um and we don't pass it forward to anyone else or engage uh to share it with anybody um and and that's i think you know a loss for us um there's so many great ideas be mindful of um of all of the different um social media platforms and 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 how people are using and engaging um in, in a way um, be mindful of the demographics of your community and how that's changing. And it's changing pretty rapidly. We can't wait f always for the census to tell us those answers, but, but really dig in and be mindful of, of, um, how our immediate, our local, our regional world is, is, is changing. Be mindful of the changing, um, demographics and the changing tenor of, of demography and also, um, uh, not just the needs, but geographically, who is isolated in your community? Um, do, does, is it hard to get to, to where you are? Um, uh, be mindful even of asking the right questions about how people are traveling to get there. You know, one of, one of the things that um, um, museums and zoos and a lot of other agencies do is they take into um, uh into their minds, the experience of the traveler and the intentionality of visiting any place, whether it's virtually or, or physically <clears throat> that, that concept known as what we might have referred to back in the days as experienceology. What is the experience of the user to get to your location, whatever that concept looks like? Um, um, are they going to have a hard time finding parking? Um, is there easy access to public transit? Are you within, are you a good walk for someone to get there? Um, what kinds of uh, experience do they have in their, in their way? Do you have good wayfinding signs? All of those things make a difference in the lives of our community because they have a choice and they do not have a, they don't have to come to us, but wouldn't it be great if we were the third place? If we were the place beyond um, this, you know, uh, the home and beyond work, if we were the third place uh, beyond school where they would actively come to visit. Um, many libraries across the country have had a hard time coming back from COVID. We don't have the same kind of experiences, but we have to adapt and learn from that. We can't just say, oh, we want everything to be based on 75% of what we experienced before we need to change and we need to be, we, we need to feel confident and, and listen to our community in that change. Um, uh, because people are going to access us in different ways. Now that they've found that we provide exemplary programming <clears throat> in a digital environment, let's keep that up. We need to meet people where they are, where they feel comfortable finding us, to encourage others that actually have not developed the same kinds of techniques um, technologically to make that safe and encourage them to use that technology to the best benefit possible. And we need to make sure that digital access uh, for everyone is, is free or low cost. Um, so that advocacy piece, appreciative inquiry, continually based learning, thinking about the experience of your community in terms of accessing um, us, meeting them more than halfway. Um, those are all the key things I think that we need to keep in mind as we're moving into the future. Thank you so much, Patty. And I have one last question for you. So in closing, I'd love for you to define your view of the future of libraries in six words or less. Oh my goodness, I know. Um, community engaged, advocate, no wrong door. I think that's, that's six. Great. <laughs> I think that's, that's great. I think that's perfect. 
That's great. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank Thank you you so much for joining me today. And thank you for your contribution to Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries. It's been a true pleasure to talk with you today and to hear more about your vision about the future of libraries. Thank you, Sandy. And thank you for attending this webcast with Patty Wong, author of Chapter 8, The Library as Community Enthusiast, Champion, and Advocate. To view additional author webcasts from this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit the link or use the QR code on your screen. And thank you again for attending.